Welcome to an aero terminology video from the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. In this video, we are going to cover the coefficient of drag. In fact, we're going to cover quite a few versions of coefficient of drag, because there's not just one. And we are barely going to scratch the surface of drag and the coefficients of drag. Drag is a very, very large subject with lots of nuance, lots of complexity. As I was editing this video, I realized it was getting far too long, and so I've cut it up into two videos. It's still pretty long, but it is what it is. I'm going to uh, talk about part one now. In a day or two, part two will come out. We're just going to introduce the very top level of drag, various parts of drag. And at the end of this video, I will give you a reference that you can go to look at to really delve into it. It's a big, huge, fat book that goes into lots of details of drag. And of course, there are lots of other books on the market that you can use to learn more about drag. The coefficients of drag that we will talk about in this video are listed here. You will generally not see this letter C sub D unless you're really just talking about generic drag. You're not talking about a specific type of drag or a coefficient of drag for a specific body shape. So you won't generally see this in the equation. The C sub D naught you will generally see when it's a coefficient of drag where you are expected to multiply by a frontal surface area. So the front area that's directly exposed to the free air. So generally what you will multiply by for surface area will be a span times a height. The C sub F is coefficient of frictional drag, and we'll get into that a little bit more. The C sub D S is coefficient of drag for a section, and in this case what they mean is a cross section, and you will generally multiply by a plan form surface area. For the coefficient of friction, I'll go back and say what you would generally multiply by this one is called a wetted area, so total surface area of an object. This last one, C sub D I, is coefficient of drag that is induced, in this case induced by lift. Typically, the coefficient of induced drag is only applied to a flying surface like a wing, elevator, rudder, V-tail, canard, etc. You will also multiply it by a plan form surface area. There are some other coefficients of drag that we're not going to get into in this video. For example, you'll have coefficients of drag for a strut shaped object and you would have coefficients of drag for a wire. But like I said, we're not going to get to those in this video, but you can certainly learn more about them in the reference that I will give you at the end of the video. So let's get started. Before we can talk about the coefficients of drag, we really need to talk about what drag is. And ultimately, drag is transferring momentum from an object that's moving through the air, transferring that momentum into the air. And it's basically turning that momentum into heat in the air. But what we want to do is to be able to calculate that drag and we want to be able to understand the mechanism for transferring that momentum from the object to the air. There are two basic categories of drag. The first is composed of skin friction and viscous pressure drag. And when you combine these two together, it's frequently called parasitic drag. And then in some cases, when we're talking about section drag and profile drag, these two will be combined into that. We will be going into more detail in later slides as we go. The next kind of drag is induced drag, which is drag that is induced due to lift of a wing. It can also be lift on an elevator, a canard, and even rudders have lift, except it's not up or down, it's side to side. Now we're only going to consider drag that in incompressible flow, which means air that's not being compressed by the airplane moving through it. Now if we were at transonic speeds or supersonic speeds that would be compressible flow and that's a whole different ball of wax when it comes to drag. Fortunately we don't have to deal with any of that when we're dealing with ultralight airplanes. Let's get started talking about the skin friction drag. In order to talk about skin friction 
drag, we need to talk about the boundary layer because the momentum of the object is transferred to the air through the boundary layer. We generally have two categories of boundary layer. Over here on the left, we have something called laminar flow boundary layer. And then next to it, I have turbulent flow boundary layer. And just from the way I've drawn these arrows, you might get a guess that laminar generally has very smooth airflow, whereas turbulent has mixed up airflow, where the airflow travels up and down through adjacent areas in the boundary layer until it finally gets up to the free air where it's no longer turbulent and it's just the free stream air. In addition, as you might expect down here near the skin, there really isn't a lot of area to move up and down. So the airflow right here next to the skin is very nearly laminar, but rapidly becomes turbulent. Now the lengths of these arrows are airspeed. So next to our skin, the air is traveling at the same speed as the skin. And this is kind of backwards of what you might expect. You might expect that the arrows would be long against the skin and short out here in the free area. This kind of way of representing the boundary layer came from doing tests in wind tunnels where the object is stationary and the wind is moving over the object. So that's why you've got a long air speed out here away from the object and zero near the object. So as you might expect, here near the object, the air molecules are hitting the surface and momentum is being transferred directly from the surface to the closest air molecules. And that makes the air molecules right next to the surface almost the identical speed as the surface. But as you start to move away from the surface, you start to get a little bit of mixing. And the air stream slowly starts moving faster and faster. And it's not a linear relationship. As you move up away from the surface, it rapidly increases in your airspeed. But regardless of that, it stays at a fairly smooth and straight air streams. Now let's move over to the turbulent area. As you can see, as you move up away from the surface, it immediately, almost immediately increases the speed rapidly. Whereas here, we've got a surely fairly short arrow. Here, the arrow's very long. And that's just due to the mixing because of the turbulence between these airs. It mixes far more than it does over here on the laminar. So that means the speed rapidly increases. The change from one depth of the boundary layer to another depth doesn't increase quite as much until you get up here to the free stream. And I tried to draw this to show that turbulent boundary layers are generally thicker than laminar boundary layers. So as you can see from this, skin friction is transferring momentum from the object out to the free stream through the boundary layer. Now I have a few more items over here to talk about. The laminar, because it's narrower in depth and smoother, has a much lower drag than the turbulent. Turbulent has much higher drag. I shouldn't say much higher drag, but it does have higher drag. And that means it's transferring more of the momentum to the free stream than the laminar does. Another thing that's kind of interesting, and it's not a big concern, but I've drawn a wing kind of viewing from the underneath. You can see the underneath surface here. This is the direction of the wing. It's dragging air in the same direction as the wing. And that's called coincident movement of the air. But there's also something called transverse movement. And that generally happens at the wing tip when it's generating the wing vortices. You have higher air pressure on the bottom than you do on the top. So the air is trying to move around this tip as it's moving back and then over the top. That causes a transverse flow of the air and that also is drag. Air moving this direction is drag, air moving that direction is drag. Although admittedly, this drag here is much less than this since this is nearly the whole span and this is only occurs out toward the wingtip.
Now that we have a little bit of an idea of how the friction drag transfers momentum from the object to the air, let's get into the coefficient of friction drag. In the wind tunnel testing that's been done, what you'll generally do is measure drag directly on your object. Now you can almost never have friction drag by itself on an object. There's usually also going to be pressure drag. But you can get pretty close with a flat plate where the plate is parallel to the direction of the wind. And in that case, you'll get almost only friction drag. So in wind tunnel, you can get an idea of what your friction drag is by measuring the drag on the plate. And then you're going to divide by the quantity of your dynamic pressure, which we've talked about in other videos, multiplied by the wetted area. And this is the area that water would touch if you submerge your object in water. So that total wetted surface area. So it doesn't include internal area, just external area. And that will give you the coefficient of friction drag. This is similar to the other coefficients that we use in our aerodynamics, and it's dimensionless which means it doesn't have any units like foot-pounds, etc. Now, if you do have your coefficient of friction, then in order to figure out what the drag is going to be, you can take your coefficient of friction, multiply by your dynamic pressure and your wetted area, and that gives you the drag in pounds or newtons or whatever your units are going to be. So if you end up changing your speed, that will change your dynamic pressure. That's how you can calculate how your drag due to friction will change as your speed changes or as your pressure changes, either one. Generally, you are not going to be using the coefficient of friction directly. It will actually be included in your parasitic drag calculations or your coefficient of parasitic drag. But I want to talk about this just so when you see it in the literature, you'll know what it is. Now we can talk about the other part of parasitic drag, and that's pressure drag. I kind of alluded to this when I was talking about friction drag. Friction drag acts tangential to the surface, whereas pressure drag actually acts normal to the surface, or you can say perpendicular to the surface. Pressure drag occurs when you have a separation of the boundary layer from the surface. So this is kind of a strut-shaped form flowing through the air, where you've got high pressure up here near the front, and you've got pretty much laminar flow coming up around to the top, or it could be turbulent. This is a pretty rounded nose, which generally causes turbulent flow. But the boundary layer is attached until it gets to this point, and then it's separating. And so what we're going to end up having is pressure drag here where the boundary layer has separated from the surface. There will be pretty much no pressure drag here. This will be all friction drag. And then it separates. We do not have much in the way of friction drag here, although there's probably a little bit. But it's mostly pressure drag. And pressure drag is due to the difference in pressure. So we've got high pressure here and low pressure here. So it's kind of pulling our object back. Now, the, it's, the pressure is actually normal to the surface, so there's a little bit of a lift. But think about, we're also going to have the same amount of pressure drag on the bottom, so it's going to also pull down. And so these vertical components cancel out, and the component that's backward add together. So that'll be our pressure drag pulling backward. I've shown one form of pressure drag that you can have on an object. In this case, we have pretty much symmetrical vortices occurring here in the low pressure area. And these vortices are created and then move aft. And as one moves out, then you get another vortice forming, and then it moves aft. And they'll generally be counter-rotating. So you can see this one's clockwise. This one should be counterclockwise. These forms of low-pressure drag will actually change depending on your Reynolds number. So you would get this where we have kind of symmetric forms coming back. You can also get alternating forms where you'll have one form here, start moving back, and then you'll have one form here. So there'd be one here one here, one here, and alternating, so you wouldn't have these here. That would happen a different Reynolds number. You can also have at much higher Reynolds number where the air is separated, but it's pretty much stagnant here in these areas, but still low pressure. 
And there's some several other forms. If you're interested in seeing those, I'll refer you to the reference that I have at the end of the video. There can be quite a few causes of pressure drag, and I've listed a few here. One can be control surface gaps. That's where you have something like an airfoil shape with something like an aileron or rudder or elevator at the trailing edge of that airfoil. And there happens to be a gap between the main part of the airfoil and your control surface. And it's pretty hard to build them without a gap, although you can. But you'll generally have lower pressure on top of that gap and higher pressure on the bottom, just because of the way the airfoils operate. You'll have air flowing through that high pressure, through the gap, to the low pressure. Well, unless you are very careful about forming that gap so that the that airflow comes out tangential to that control surface, in other words, along the boundary layer, parallel to the boundary layer, it's going to shoot out and it'll cause a separation of that boundary layer and you'll end up with low pressure on the top of your control surface. Of course, that's pressure drag then because we separated the boundary layer. Another way you can do it is having blunt trailing edges, so kind of a cutoff trailing edge or a very rounded trailing edge. That will also have pressure drag. and In those cases, you'll frequently get the uh, kind of drag that I was talking about before. We have alternating vortices forming, going back and forth and trailing behind the edge. Another kind that you can have is what we were talking about previously, where you have too much curvature in the pressure recovery area. And let me go back real quick to that. This here, where you've got this trailing edges coming back together, is pressure recovery area. If we had the boundary layer attached, this would be our lowest pressure area, generally up in this area, and your pressure will start increasing as you come back to the trailing edge and come pretty close to being the same pressure as you have out here in front. It won't quite be that much, but it'll be fairly close. So this is called the pressure recovery, where the pressure is coming back up to match what we have in front. But if you have too much curvature here, you're going to get your boundary layer separation. And of course, your pressure drag. Now these aren't the only ways you can get pressure drag. Uh, you can have interference drag, which is a form of pressure drag. And there's just quite a few others that are really too many to count, and I didn't put them in here. As I said with the friction drag, the coefficient of friction is not usually something that's calculated. It'll generally be part of a parasitic coefficient of drag. So your pressure drag and friction drag will be combined together into one coefficient. This is where I'm going to cut off part one of the video on the coefficient of drag. On the screen you see a reference that I used in putting together this video and the slides for this video. It is the book Fluid Dynamic Drag by Sigurd Horner from 1965. And if you do a careful web search, you can actually find this online in a PDF form. I'll also put this reference at part two so you don't have to jump videos back and forth if you need to get the reference again. In part two, we will start talking about combining the friction drag and pressure drag into various forms of parasitic drag and how to use those coefficients for parasitic drag. And then we'll also talk about the induced drag coefficient.